This episode of Standard Orbit is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter. Visit enterpriseinspace.org. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Risk is our business. It's like nothing we've dealt with before. Golly, Jim, I'm beginning to think I can cure a rainy day. I can't change the laws of physics. Welcome, everyone, to Standard Orbit, Trek FM's dedicated podcast that covers the original series. I am Ken Tripp. And I am Zag Moore, and we are thrilled today to bring in our first guest to Standard Orbit, Christine M. Smith, author of DeForest Kelly, Up Close and Personal, A Harvest of Memories, from the fan who knew him best, Welcome, Christine. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to do this with you. Chris, this is a big deal for us. Trust me. Uh, I am so thankful that, that, that you reached out to us. And, you know, I, I want to just get right into this interview because um, now that I've, I've finished the book and I've read through it, it's like, OK, now I really want to get the, the, the good stuff out and, and really get our, our listeners and fans to understand who you are as well as DeForest Kelly. Kelly. So I'll start with this. You know, as uh, as a person who loves to understand how things work, whether it's processes, products, people, relationships, my re- my first request, I guess, and question to you is kindly brief us on how you developed your relationship with DeForest Kelly and his wife Carolyn. And for me, a part of as you as you talk about developing that relationship, the courage you had to have to make some of the big moves from where you were living into your career in order to foster that friendship with DeForest. Wow, that's a big question. Yeah. Um, the reason I wrote the book is because Terry asked me a very similar question and I couldn't answer it. The question she asked me, Terry is DeForest Kelly's uh, biographer, as you know, he wrote, she wrote from Sawdust to Stardust, the biography of Star Trek's Dr. McCoy. And she asked me, how did you go from becoming a fan on the outermost reaches of fandom to being at his bedside when he passed away? And I did not know the answer to that. I said to her, I think that's something you would have had to ask Dee, because I don't know what was in his mind. I mean, what? And she goes, Chris, you know the answer. You just have to connect the dots. And because I'm a, you know, I've been writing journals my entire life, I went back into all my journals and I just connected the dots. Because when I first met him, I was, let's see, 1968, I was 17 years old. I was this timid, shy, rather introspective Star Trek fan. And I met him at a a parade in Wenatchee, Washington. I thought I was just gonna see him go by. And as luck would have it, I saw the limousines beside the uh, road there. I thought, you know, if I loiter shamelessly, maybe I could actually meet him and not just see him go by. (laughs) So I did that, and eventually Dean Carolyn came out and got into the limo, and I was a little afraid because I thought, you know, you can meet people and get really disappointed. So I hung back a little bit, and I was really hesitant, and I just watched him interact with the fans who came up to him, and I very quickly realized this guy is soul of the earth. He is so appreciative, so gentlemanly, so friendly. So I screwed up my courage to go and ask him for an autograph. We we exchanged a few words. I got his autograph. And on the way home, I was just like in this cocoon of warmth about this human being who I wanted to be wonderful, but I didn't expect to be quite that wonderful. And so there was a creative writing assignment due. And I decided to write about meeting him. And I called it, how clever was this? The Real McCoy. Mm-hmm. And my teacher said, this is really good. Why don't you send a copy of this to Mr. Kelly? And I went, gosh, I don't write to movie stars, you know? And he said, well, if you impress somebody as obviously as he impressed you, wouldn't you want to know? And I went, yeah, but he's, a, he's an actor. He probably hears that 10 times a day. And he just basically pulled rank on me and he said, send it. 
And I know he was going to mark me down, you know, in those things, those career things, if I did <laughs> obedience things. So I did it. Forgot all about it because that was the year Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were assassinated. Mm. So shortly after that, sometime after that, I got a letter from him saying, we were so impressed with your letter and your story that we submitted it to TV Star Parade magazine. And they want to publish it as a special holiday issue. My parents had to peel me off the ceiling. I had wanted to be a writer, you know, but I was living in the sticks. I didn't know how good I was. And when I came out, it was like they hadn't changed a word. And Dee said, you know, he just continued to encourage me as a writer. Um, and I lost touch with him for a, a period of years. But at the 20th anniversary of Star Trek, I went back to Spokane, Washington to reconnect and to thank him for having launched my writing career. Because by now I had, you know, lots of articles and stuff published. And I wanted to thank him for launching my writing career got back to Spokane and met him again there. And he said, don't lose touch again. We always wondered what happened to the little girl who wrote so well. So from that point on, I established a pen pal type relationship with him. And as it got closer to the end of the 80s, he said, I was telling them I really felt you know, stymied at where I was because my writing career wasn't going the way I wanted it to really. It wasn't going anywhere particularly. And he said, why don't you come down to Hollywood and get in, the, in here, down here with the creatives? And Carol and his wife started sending me all these articles about the wonders of living in Southern California and working in the industry and encouraging me to come down. So I ended up coming down. As those of you who have read the book know I also came down with an African serval cat because I had a <laughs> serval from the time he was five days old until he, was, until he passed away at 17. And I brought this serval down and parked him at Tippi Hedren's Wildlife Preserve, Shambhala. She said she would watch him until I could find a landlord who'd let me have a wild animal in the backyard. He didn't know he was a wild animal. He, was, he thought he was a human, let alone a wild animal. But anyhow, um, so I was separated from him for 15 months, and the Kellys are always, we went up to Shambhala to meet Deacon because they, they loved Deacon from afar. And it just evolved that way to where we went from, you know, to getting together occasionally to hey, I got a bunch of stuff at the studio here, all of these samples, these Star Trek samples. You want to come over and take what you want? And I'd go over there and I'd take, you know, the Tholian Lueb globes or whatever it was, mm -hmm. ties, mugs, you know. He'd say, we got a box full of stuff here. Come look through them. So it just became really familial-like yeah. and affectionate and great fond bonds, you know, the fond bonds that you, that you build with people. And... And then at the end of his life, when he fell ill, Carolyn had fallen a year before that and broken her leg. So she was in a hospital. They had no children. Dee was falling more and more ill. And he ended up in intensive care in a hospital. And A.C. Lyles, Paramount producer A.C. Lyles, calls me up one day and says, Chris, uh, Dee is dying. I just about died myself when he said that because Dee hadn't told me any of this stuff. Because my mother had passed away like eight months previous to that with brain cancer, and I had been her caregiver. And I think Dee didn't want me to know he was in similar dire straits. So he didn't tell me until, until he needed help, essentially. Right. And he called me and says, can you come and take care of the Kelly's house and water their lawns and feed their turtle and, you know, do what you, whatever they, the mail, can you help us basically tie up loose ends? And I said, absolutely, I could. I left Warner Brothers at that point. I was working at Warner Brothers. And I left Warner Brothers at that time to take care of Dee the last part of his life. And at that point, I became his caregiver and his personal assistant. And strangely enough, people who are in the hospital also still have doctor appointments. So I would drive him to his doctor appointments and bring him back. And it was that last intense period of time there are a lot of great stories in this book. I don't want you to think this is a tearjerker story all the way through. Most of the book is absolutely hysterically funny because he's a very, very funny guy. But toward the end of his life is when I realized they really, really do trust me. I mean, just with everything they own, they trust me with everything they own. And that's when I began to sort of discern that, yeah, they, they aren't just being very, very kind to a fan. They really do trust me and and love me so um and then terry rio who wrote the book the biography said to me 
Okay. Oh, D also gave me permission to write his biography, but I'm an anecdotal writer. I'm not a biographer. I'm not an interviewer. But all of this information that D had given me, I gave it to Terry Rio because um, Bill Moyer is a big fan of hers. And I knew she could do the job. So I gave her all of that information he had given me for the bio. I said, you write the bio. You're the biographer. You're the historian. And I'm going to write this, this one, this, what it's like to be mentored and essentially almost raised by a second set of parents um, because the two books are mutually exclusive. One is a biography. It's, it's like apples and oranges. There's very, very little um, information that's the same except where maybe Terry quotes my book in hers or something like that. Correct. Gotcha. Very complimentary, yes. So, yeah, it, yeah, and you know, a couple of things um, uh, that that I want to pull out of that. It, it definitely is not a uh, it's not a sad book at all. In fact, it's it's a book that I I was smiling a lot reading it because you can, you, it, you know, for those of you out there that are that are that are like a lot of us, where you know you wonder what it would be like to just arbitrarily approach somebody that you really admire, and then the next thing you know, over a period of many years, even with a big span of years in between, ten fifteen years. Um, you know, he's still asking about you. And then the next thing you know, you become uh, a close, valued friend and to the point of becoming, as I was saying, you know, like an adopted daughter between him and Carolyn, who what's amazing is, is, you know, as I, as I was reading this and you and your friends and, and, the, and, the, and the fan club that were always showing up and um, just having a good time or whatnot, I always in the back of my head said, boy, does Carolyn feel threatened at all? And then you could see absolutely not. It was just... Um, it really was like you were an adopted really daughter, was. they, wasn't it? I think they considered us their biggest boosters. You go out there and have every yeah. kind of fun you can have because, I mean, we were talking about how sexy he was and all this stuff, you know, and I thought, in fact, I did a stand-up comedy routine called Husband Hunting on the Enterprise where I'm, you know, I'm, who would I marry on the Enterprise? You know, not Captain <laughs> Kirk because of this, not Mr. Spock because of this, but Dr. McCoy, he could put his boots underneath my bed anytime. And it was so funny because I was so concerned about that. Again, they, have, they compartmentalized his career from who he was. And very, very well. And so if I was going to lust after Dr. McCoy, that was fine because that's, that was his public persona, you know, type thing. But I was so nervous about it. I actually sent it to them and I said, if you don't want me to do this, I won't do it. And they, they said, oh my God, go for it. That's hysterical. Go for it. And, and then when I actually was presenting it, like with Mrs. Kelly in the, in the front row and D backstairs listening, I'm going, this is insane. And then somebody came up from a TV studio right after and said, well, you come to my TV studio in Oakland and do that for me. I said, what? You don't have a Star Trek audience. He says, I will find you a Star Trek audience. Will you please come do this? Well, I had a super saver fear and I couldn't do that. But it was like, you know, that's, they, they compartmentalized it. They knew I was safe and right. that they knew me well enough by then to know I was safe and that was perfectly okay. Go ahead. Everybody, people think I'm quite sexy. <laughs> well, women. Well, do. I don't know. You know. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tougher question. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think he is. Uh, he was always a, uh, his character. His character in the show was always a man of of of, as Spock said, you know, deep feeling and deep emotion and and, and all that. But you could see that he was very much the um, the person of upstanding character, challenging the norms and making sure they were always doing the right thing. And I. You know, but I, I would say that uh, from what I've read, both in Terry's book and your book, is that he wasn't irascible. He was just very calm, and he could write. And he was probably so good at um, disarming um, volatile conversations because you could just see him as a calm influence um, that everybody around him just would just stop and listen because they just wanted to hear what he had to say. He never probably ever had to raise his voice. Richard Arnold tells a story, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but he, when D did the 137-year-old Admiral McCoy, the oh, yeah. empowering at Farpoint, okay. uh, D wanted to do that as a thank you for Gene Roddenberry. He wanted to do it at, at the lowest possible acting cost. Right. And he said, I want to do this for you. It's my way to pass the torch, whatever, whatever. And they said, okay, D, come on in. We'll need you in here at 4.30 in the morning for makeup because it was extensive makeup. 
And then we should have you out of here by 10 or 11, okay? And he says, fine. He gets up at 4.30. They put on this horrendous makeup. He's <laughs> drinking his breakfast through a straw. 10.30 comes and go. 11.30 comes and go. 12.30 comes and go. He drinks his lunch through a straw. And he's like, okay, this is getting kind of old pretty fast, you know? And never... Five o'clock rolls around, and he walks over to Richard, and he says, he looks at his watch, and he says, I'm going to call Carol, and I'm going to tell her I'm going to be home in an hour. Mm -hmm. And he's like, we're going to do it right now, Dean. He said, oh, I would appreciate that. <laughs> that was not, even, not even as emotionally as I just did it. Sure. Sure. Nice and calm. So um, he was absolutely as level and as loving and as accepting, you know, things happen. I'm not going to get upset about it. We just need to fix this, okay? That kind of stuff. So in, in talking with you, Chris, I can see you're a person of high energy, right? I mean, that's, you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're, you express yourself with passion and so forth. And everything that, that D does on stage as an actor, you see, but in real life, he didn't. And so... When, when, when you guys were, and, and I remember this very specifically from the part of the book, you guys had a lot of things in common in terms of, you know, um, your, your charities and the focus on animals and, and doing the right things and animal testing and, and all that stuff. So there was a connection there. But how did getting to know DeForest Kelly as well as you did affect you as a person? I, I may have said it earlier, not sure if I did. It just made me go from being this timid, introspective person to being more adult developed and self-respecting and built a little self-esteem into what I was doing. He always said what I did was excellent work. And he, I think he helped raise me really. Um, so it was, he made a tremendous, tremendous impact on my life. I used to be a way more impatient than I am okay. because when I saw how he handled people, I thought, Chris, you don't need to, you know, come unglued when something doesn't go your way. You need to think about it. You know, it's not, you know, it's not a hill worth dying on. And why would you want to cause someone to feel worse? Why would you want to complain when you can just explain? A person doesn't feel attacked or ashamed or guilty or in any other way responsible for your upsetness, you know, yeah. um, that kind of thing. Cool. Well, you know, I think this book is, is so important because DeForest Kelly, and he, he passed away so long ago now, it's been, you know, 16, 17 years. Uh, a lot of fans and just people in general don't ha don't have the insight into him as a person as, as they do as so many of the new, or uh, the surviving cast, should I say, you know, Shatner and Takei and those guys are still around. They're making convention appearances. And, you know, we have, you know, little snippets of interviews and, and stuff like that. And, you know, we cherish those. You see those archival interviews, and those are great to see. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to get these windows into his him as a person beyond just just Star Trek. And uh, and speaking of beyond Star Trek, you know, when, when you look back at, at DeForest Kelly's career after Star Trek, uh, wh why do you think he didn't pursue as much acting uh, as Avali as his other co-stars? I mean, he had a few things Can in I the 70s. Can oh, sure, sure. I one thing before I answer your question? Sure. Quick. The people who reach out to me most often now are kids, 14, 15, 16-year-old kids who didn't even know he was dead until they finally have, they discover him, mm -hmm. they find out he has died, and they feel like they've lost something that they knew was very, very, would have been very, very valuable to them. And they reach out to me and they say, please tell me more. Well, another reason that I wrote this book is because people... Once they meet him or see those snippets on YouTube, those interviews, they always feel like there's this big hole in their lives that I wish I knew more about this guy. Now, some of the other Trek fans feel that way, too, because maybe they were focused on other characters and other actors at the time. And then when they lost him, they realized what they had lost. Mm -hmm. But the people I most hear of now are the kids who weren't even born or were one-year-old or two-year-olds when he died, and they are devastated, devastated that they don't get an opportunity to meet him. And my greatest joy is hearing from those fans who have read the book and said, I feel like I know him now. Thank you so much for that. I feel now I know he was, I always thought he was a good man, but now I know he was a good man and he was somebody to you know, look for a role model and try to be that kind of a role model to other people so that, you know, they can, again, 
maybe help raise themselves in the way he helped raise me. So, so Chris, could you expand a little bit on that? So if, if you know, the, the youth that you're saying that are, that are reaching out and they're the ones that you hear from most, one, that is incredible and I think wonderful. Um, are, are these are these just young people that are are starting to find Star Trek, or or they're 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 more of the, I guess the current generation, and they're starting to look back. What what drew them to DeForest Kelly? Possibly what started that is when they remastered the episode, so they didn't look so antique. Okay. So that people said, "Oh, I can watch this show now. It doesn't look like you know like it did when we first watched it. It was state of the art at the time, but it certainly is not anymore." Yeah. And I think as a result of remastering those episodes in what the mid '90s, kids started yeah. watching. Parents who loved the show started sharing it with their kids, and their kids would actually sit through it, and they would go, "Oh my gosh." You know, these are great stories. These are great characters. These are great, you know, and I think, I'm only guessing. Yeah. Um, that, I think, is when that started over again. Well, yeah, the uh, re- remastered Star Trek was uh, 2006, I believe, and then that's when they, they, they put it back into syndication. You know, it had been off television, yeah. Yeah, that's about right, because these kids that are reaching out to me are anywhere from 12 to 16 to 17 years old. Wow. So it's about that time when when this started happening in a big way with me. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm younger than both of you guys, so I'm uh, <laughs> I didn't really have as much chance to uh, uh, you know I never had an opportunity to even like go to a convention. DeForest Kelly was at I was I was too young. So uh, and like you said, it's always we got because I've worked in the media and I've encountered you know people that I've I've seen on television or film or celebrities right and it's always a kind of a roll of the dice you're like okay is this guy gonna be cool is he not like I'm always very hesitant to it to uh, engage in conversation because you kind of not that you know not that I put people on pedestals but you can't help but have a certain uh, uh, you know just just mindset about somebody that, that that forms over watching them on television and film for so long so it, it's, it's always just it's so heartwarming and refreshing to, to to find out you know what this guy that I liked and respected on screen as a character obviously I know he is not his character but it, it's good to know that yes he represents what that character represents and he's just an all-around good guy and that's just great to hear about DeForest Kelly so, so. yes and and another interesting thing about it, I don't know if you ever saw him in his cowboy roles. I just did an interview yesterday about his westerns and what a rowdy cowboy he was and what a badass cowboy he was. Mm. And the NBC at first didn't want him as Dr. McCoy because they said no one will ever believe this guy as a good guy. Here is the best guy on the planet, you know, <laughs> and they don't believe him as a good guy because he's such a good bad guy, you know. So I think that's where a lot of people are saying, is this guy really like Dr. McCoy or is he more like Toby Jack Saunders, who was a hellion, you know, in the movies? So anybody who watched Dee's career from the time he did cowboy stuff to the time he did Star Trek stuff, they were kind of feeling a little, you know, conflicted about what is this guy really like? Well, how just can, how good of an actor how can he, he take anything that alien to himself, a, a, you know, a killer, and make it re- as real as he did if there wasn't a little bit of a killer in him you know so yeah i was a little intimidated and scared and oh boy i didn't have a thing to worry about and no one ever did who ever met him um and you're right people do put people on pedestals i did put him on a pedestal at first and i thought you know and then almost immediately as soon as you met him and interacted with him and had a dinner with him there was no longer any pedestal there because he wouldn't he would never have allowed you to keep him on a pedestal it was just like You know, we all put our pants on the same, you know, one leg at a time and very, very down to earth. Yeah, he he just seemed to be a guy that, like, pursued fame. It's just something that happened to him. It it happened to him. Absolutely, it happened to him. Um, Oh, and you asked me earlier why... I think he didn't pursue acting after Star Trek very much. Yeah, yeah, because uh, just a few things in the 70s, and then and then his last uh, credit was the Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, and that was pretty much the extent of his post-Star Trek work. <laughs> he wanted to do more, but after McCoy, I, I told you about the typecasting before he became McCoy. Well, mm-hmm. after McCoy, nobody, he was typecast as a good guy. He wanted to do some more Westerns. He did one called, uh, it was going to be a pilot, for a series based on the Cowboys, the movie, the John Wayne movie, The Cowboys. And he did that one pilot, and people said, nobody's ever going to believe he was a bad guy. In fact, now, 
if you go back and you watch the old Western, you say, oh, that's Dr. McCoy acting like a good guy. I mean, like a bad guy. No, it's not. Forrest Kelly, I mean, Bones wasn't born yet. Born, born, Bones wasn't a portrayal yet. So at the end of his life, he wanted to go back. He said, scoundrels are really the most interesting people to do. Absolutely, the bad guys. And he wanted to do them, and he just wasn't getting. He was getting more Dr. McCoy roles, and he said, been there and done that. Mm -hmm. um, and he just wasn't being challenged anymore. He want, he would have loved, he said, to do, um, what was the Scott, the Enterprise, oh, what was the series? Quantum Leap. Yeah. He said, I would have given my right arm to do Quantum Leap. Because that's the kind of acting chops he had. He wanted to be doing, you know, things that challenged him instead of same old, same old. And one of the things that challenged him was being a really good bad, bad guy. So I think that's why he just said, hey, you know, I'm happy staying at home. I don't have to work. So whatever work I do, I want it to be valuable. A lot of sense, but he, he certainly did do a lot of personal appearances, more than I realized as uh, we were talking before the show. Yeah. I, I you know, I was saying, Zach, that I, um, you know, I used to go to a lot of conventions when I was a kid, younger kid, um, before the 25th anniversary. And he's one of the guys I never saw. I, I don't know if he made it out to Boston or New England very often, because I, I wasn't doing what you were doing, Chris, and that was finding new and unique ways to get across the country really? and hooking up with roommates to try to find your way into a convention, which is a whole nother great piece of this book that I, I want people to read about, because, you know, there are dedicated fans out there, and then there are dedicated fans but um uh, i i thought that was that was a wonderful piece of it and i was like man you know because i i would have done that if i was as creative as you in finding ways to do it but um uh, i that is that is such a a, a a trouble spot for me i think in my in my uh in my fandom of Star Trek, because I am and always have been an original cast guy and um, always loved the, the, all of them, but particularly the big three. And, uh, you know, as we were talking about acting and, and so forth, um, this, is, this is one that's off the cuff, but I, I just got to know. So whenever he looked at himself as uh, Dr. McCoy in Star Trek, the motion picture with the, you know, the, the, the vernacular now is they call him Disco Bones. Has he ever had... <laughs> Has he had ever had any any comments about the way he looked when he came off that transporter? I just got to know. You mean the the beard? The beard and the big medallion and the wide open shirt. I mean, it was great. They, uh, disco bones. That's what they call him nowadays. <laughs> well, according to D, where he was before when they called him back. So I don't know how I, how he ended up with disco bones. Well, so that's today's vernacular. Yes. Yeah. Um, he, in in his opinion, bones up until he got redrafted. Yeah. was actually out on other planets as being a veterinarian to oh. animals oh, okay. because he was okay. a huge animal lover. And he says they called him back and it really ticked him off. So how he got back <laughs> with the beard and the, well, when you're with animals, you don't have to shave, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that, that's yeah, crazy. I, he incorporated that into the character because I, I'm a huge animal lover myself and dog lover. So I, I gravitate towards, towards his interest in animals as well. So that's, that's cool. He kind of makes that into his own personal backstory there with bones. And in the trouble with tribbles, you'll notice, you know, Earl says, you're not going to hurt him, are you? I won't harm a hair. Oh, i got to tell you another thing. In the Western, uh, one of the Westerns A.C. Lyles did, to help de-establish his character as a really, really, really rotten son of a gun. He said, I want you to ride into town. There's a dot. Obviously, this wouldn't have really happened because the American Humane Association was watching stuff. But he said, I want you to ride into town. The dog is going to announce somebody rode into town, and I want you to pull out your gun and shoot him. Ooh. And he said, not on your life. I am not going to shoot a dog. I said, I will establish his character in another way, but I am not going to shoot a dog. Wow. So, I mean, he put his foot down in a lot of ways. That little pinky ring he wore, mm -hmm. he, Roddenberry wanted him to take it off because that had come from his mother. His, her brother had won it in a card match when he was in France, fighting in France, okay. and had sent it to her. And when she died, that was the only thing of hers that he wanted. And he wore it on his finger until the end of his life. And 
Gene Roddenberry said, we're not, we're not going to have jewelry on the show. And he said, if you're not going to have my ring on the show, you're not going to have me on the show. And, and Gene said, okay, Dr. McCoy's going to wear a pinky ring. All righty then, you know? So, I mean, there were certain things that he, when he stood, he stood. Yeah. I mean, like you said, he was a pretty, seemed to be a pretty easygoing guy, but he, he picked his battles wisely. Exactly. So, you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, he didn't say it like nasty. He just said, no, if you don't want my ring, you won't have me, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Did I answer your question? Well, I think I went off on a tangent here. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's that. That's what that's what makes these shows so much fun, Chris. To be honest with you, these are the thing. You know, it's like I said, we 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 try to make a a decent outline so we know what's coming, and then they always go off in different things. And I don't know why disco bones entered my head. I um. I, 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 all I know is that, uh, you know, and, and people think I'm nuts, but Star Trek, the motion picture, I, I defend it. It's my favorite motion picture of all the Star Trek movies, including all the reboots. I just love that movie. And, uh, his character in it is, is, you know, when he comes aboard much more so than Spock, that's when the ship comes to life. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 that, and, and that's, that's, that's a nice when piece. They re, when they, you know, they had edited it a lot to make it mostly about V'ger and how it took you 45 minutes to get through V'ger, which is why they called it Star Trek, the motionless picture. Most of the, most I of remember. The but yeah. when they, they had taken out a lot of scenes that McCoy was in, in order to bring that thing in under the time it had when it was, when it was released. Well, later on, they released another one and put those scenes back in. And mm -hmm. at that point, that move, motion picture came to life for me because there was backstories we didn't even hear about when it hit the theaters. Yeah. It was it, later on, there were backstories that made Spock's, you know, Spock was really, mm -hmm. had to stick up his butt in that one. And, but there was all this story that wasn't, uh, wasn't given in when it was released to the theaters. They put it back in later. They realized that they had missed some of the essential uh, values and, and heart part of Star Trek. Yeah, the, um, the issue really was they spent all that money on special effects and they wanted to show them regardless of yes. how slow. $21 million on yeah. the special effects. Yeah, the director's edition is, is definitely superior than the actual cut. Yeah. It's a great, yeah, it's, it's a great was, version. Yeah. I know about five minutes into that thing, I was going, okay, we understand it's a big thing. Can we stop this now? You know? Right. <laughs> Don't make me defensive now, Chris. I know, I know, but it was beautiful. I'm it sensitive. Is beautiful. Okay. <laughs> I'm it, kidding. It was like, beautiful if you just want to like, you know, it's like, for a while. It's like Texas, right, Zach? Yeah. Uh, Texas, Texas, I'll live in Texas. Okay, it's don't big. Yeah. It's big. Yes, it's really big. <laughs> it's really Do big. I want to watch every foot of the way through Texas, though? I'm going to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good analogy right there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Zach, why don't you pick up on seven since we, I think we already hit that other yeah. one. So, so Chris, on, on a much lighter note, I know we were talking about, you know, the, the uh, we've talked a lot of serious stuff in this conversation here, but uh, what is your opinion of, of Carl Urban's interpretation of Dr. McCoy in the, in the reboot films? I was scared to death to go see Carl Urban because I knew I was going to be doing an interview about four days later, the, the first time mm -hmm. he did it. I thought, oh, my God, I am so scared. I, I, I almost said I won't go watch it. That way I won't have to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, I've got to do it. I've got to go do it. So I went and got, and I was so relieved and so delighted and so excited. I thought, I wish Dee was here to see this. Carl Urban is a huge I, I, DeForest Kelly fan and a huge Dr. McCoy fan. And yeah. he absolutely came as close to nailing the spirit and the essence of Dr. McCoy as anybody I can imagine on the planet. He wore the pinky ring. He, I didn't I don't know how he got that accent being from New Zealand. I mean, he just did a fabulous job. And this newest one, uh -huh. that Scott yeah. McCoy relationship is so close to the, to the original thing, the, the banter between the two. I'm just delighted. And I so wish D had been able to see that because I think he would have cried, you know, yeah. with delight at it, just in the same way Leonard did with Zachary. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just really sad that Carl Urban never got to meet him because I think 
that would have been a highlight of his life because I know he loved him so much. He just did a fabulous job, yeah. in my opinion. No, I, I agree. I think I think Urban is is by far the the best of, of recapturing the original character. I mean, he has his own little spin on it, but still, I mean, you can you can definitely feel like the essence of DeForest Kelly. He's channeling DeForest Kelly because Carl Urban, I mean, yeah, he's Australian. I mean, he does these these action movies like Dread, you know. But 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 when he transforms into McCoy, that he is McCoy, and he and he he has been one of my favorites from from the jump. You hit it exactly right. It, he isn't channeling DeForest Kelly. He's channeling DeForest Kelly's Doctor McCoy. Yeah. <laughs> he's got Doctor McCoy. Um, in a in just a visceral visceral way, and it would be so easy for him to to like uh, rely on the catchphrases and stuff. And even though he says all the obligatory catchphrases, it is not cheesy. It's not a parody. You know, you, you believe him. You know, <laughs> it's not satire. He has got Doctor McCoy, and I'm just delighted. I couldn't be happier. I did, I didn't know he was wearing the pinky ring. That's that's so that is um, I guess more reflective of DeForest Kelly than. Um, it's Dr. On his McCoy. Left okay. pinky finger. If you I'll, I'll now, when you watch, you can see it. And yeah. so does Carl Urban. And Carl Urban wore that medallion too as the disco. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. About the yeah. disco bones. Yeah. <laughs> Car- Carl Urban, much like Ken, that uh, he says his favorite Star Trek film is the motion picture. So that's how you know he's a true fan, right, Ken? <laughs> I think it just has to go with um, you know extremely good looking people. I think seem to go in that direction. I'm, that's that's my scientific analysis of that. Believe me, I saw it five angle. times. I I said I want this Star Trek series to come back. I went back. I said you know I will see this as many times as it takes Paramount to realize we need more of these. We need more of these. Oh, and sure. they did. The fans went and went and went. So Paramount realized it had money in the pocket if they would make more of them. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it, it it definitely did that, and uh, you know, I, I think that's one. You know, the the other the other piece of this. Let's let's tie this all in a nice little bow with the Carl Urban piece. So, in reading the book, Chris, uh, I thought it was interesting that um, you know he obviously William Shatner was the um, the handsome guy and and kind of the, uh, the 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 big attractive, and and then Leonard Nimoy, Spock, be you know over time, over a short amount of time, became, quote unquote, the more popular of those two. Uh, and you had noted that, you know, hey, you know, DeForest Kelly is a is a good looking man. And then you said when you saw him in person, you were just like, oh, no, he is well beyond a good looking man. He is a very, very good looking man, very handsome man. And, you know, and, and, and it, it was interesting to, to hear that point of view, because nowadays, you know, you could argue that Dr. McCoy is the... Um, the eye candy of of the reboots. You could argue it, I think, successfully. And Carl Urban, you know. Yeah, strangely enough, DeForest Kelly, I mean, as as handsome as he looks in two-dimensional, you're looking at him on a flat screen, you're looking at him in photographs. Yeah. He's not bad looking. But when you see him in 3D and three-dimensional, mm-hmm. the, the flat thing does something that – detracts from the way he actually looked. I don't know how else to say that, but when I saw him, I went, oh my gosh, what did they do on Star Trek to make him look so, you know, just kind of average. I mean, handsome average, but sure. not really totally, you know, almost like <gasps> thing. So and, when you- and when he was, when I saw, when I was on the set of Star Trek V, we waited for a while and he came onto the soundstage about 35 feet away and he was wearing the deer skin from Rora Pente. Oh, six. Okay. And he, okay, six, I'm sorry. Rora Pente. Mm-hmm. And he had this several days growth of beard and they had him, of course, made up. Yeah. And like from 25 feet away, you could see his blue eyes. Yeah. And it was like, Oh my God, I have never seen Dr. McCoy before in 3D. You know, and it would, it, again, I'd known him by that time for several years and it, it took my breath away because I'd seen him as D and I'd seen him now as Dr. McCoy in 3D. And the, the cameras just don't, they don't capture people exactly because you end up flat. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, we went off on a tangent on that one, but that yes, was fun. Yes, we did. Yes, that we was did. kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> All right, Zach. Zach, did you have any more questions, sir? Oh, no. I, I could ask, I could 
continue to ask questions, but I, I, I have not finished the book. Ken, Ken is more familiar uh, than I am, but I, I'm looking forward to to, to, to completing it, and I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure I'll have some more questions. So so you know, thank you, thank you so much for your time. Christine. Thank and, you. And, if you want to bring me back and ask, do it again sometime yeah, yeah. after you've read it, that would be great. Well, yeah, we would love to have you back any any time to talk any any kind of D. Kelly, Dr. McCoy, any kind of conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely we'll be in touch. So. Well, you, well you, you were there for, uh, you know, in, in reading the book. And, and I, I mean, like I was saying before, your book is definitely focused on DeForest Kelly. Um, and, and it's like I said, I was I was just as interested, if not more so, in your adventure than, than his. Obviously, him being the, the focal point that draws you in. Uh, Chris, but you know, I, I think it's this is this is something. If you don't mind, I'd love to have you back and explore further because, to me, that the the whole, you know, now that that I've gotten through it and um, um, with tears flowing and everything, I'm I'm an emotional guy. I used to be I used to be tough back in the day, but not anymore. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where uh, it's just an extraordinary story and. Uh, but it's also as much as it's your story of your friendship, it is your story and it is an amazing story. And, um, I, I, I do want to, um, to pull you back in the not too distant future and, and explore that a little bit more, if you don't mind, because I, I, I to me, that's, that's a, another aspect. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, it really does kind of bring you in on all the different possibilities that are out there. And this is, this is really cool. I mean, it's just, it's so unique. Awesome. Thank you. I would love to do that. I would absolutely love to come back. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful review that you just gave right there. <laughs> well, it, it, like I said, you know, I, I think because, um, well, Star Trek's 50 years old. And, uh, uh, you know, this is this is one of the, uh, the, the key people, the, the as they used to say, the, the, the three of the of the of the Trinity. Right. And uh, he was such a, a big part of um, my life growing up in terms of just fandom. And I think a lot of people turned to Star Trek to escape what was going on. And they found this world and they found all this this wonderful place where all are welcome. And and you just, you know, enlightened us a lot on on a key figure. And and I have read all the biographies uh, for all of the casts, the ones that they wrote themselves and other people that wrote. I've, I've read a lot about Gene Roddenberry. And yet I feel like I know more about DeForest Kelly in reading this book than I do about any of the other cast members from reading their own. Yeah, it's really incredible. It's really incredible. So I, I do encourage people. Yeah, you, you've got to read this book. It'll draw you in. That was my plan when writing the book, because I had people come up to me and say, he seemed to be a good man. And I went, no, he didn't just seem to be a good man. He was a good man. I mean, he was the full meal deal. There is... If I, I said it as memorial service. In my opinion, I still believe it to this day. DeForest Kelly was the kind of man God had in mind when he created Adam. If the world was more, you know, heavily populated with DeForest Kelly types, it would be the paradise we all wish it was. Yeah. He was an absolute salt of the earth human being. I would like to mention one other thing if we're ending this now. I did a, um interview yesterday on his westerns career mm -hmm. please if you've never seen his westerns go and listen to this interview and it and i can point you to a lot of his westerns that you can still see to this day so you can see what a risk and how hard gene roddenberry had to fight to get him as dr mccoy because the nbc people thought no he's he's a bad guy no one will ever believe him as dr mccoy yeah, we'll have to. So, what was what, what was the show that you did the interview on? Voices of the West dot net. Voices of the West dot. And the, and they already have uploaded the interview. So if you go there and click on yesterday's date, you can listen to that mm -hmm. podcast, and it's all about DN westerns. Oh, and coming up in November December issue of Cowboys and Cowboys and Indians magazine, there will be an article I wrote about Dee's western career. A lot of the anecdotes he told on stage about falling on his gun and getting hurt and all kinds of stuff, funny stuff that happened with his, his draw against Henry Fonda, all kinds of stuff. So um, <laughs> that will be in the November, December issue of Cowboys and Indians magazine, and that'll be on the newsstands in mid-October. I really want to try to convince Trek fans to check out his earlier career because I think it will help them realize what a heck of a great actor he was. My dad said, until I met you, I had no idea what a good actor you were. 
you deserve an Oscar for those SOBs you played. Wow. I don't know how anybody found anything that alien to himself to be able to have anybody believe he was. Oh, one of his dearest friends, who they since he was 18 years old, he asked her one time, have you ever seen any of my Westerns? She said, no, Dee, I would never watch any of your Westerns. And he says, why? He says, well, because I could never, ever believe you as a bad guy. Right. He turned on her at that moment and turned into, I mean, that fast, turned into Toby Jack Saunders, one of his baddest bad guys, scared her so bad instantaneously that she started to cry. <laughs> and he started to cry because he said, honey, I didn't want to scare you. I just wanted to show you I could do it. You know, and it scared her half to death. You know, so. Did, did she watch the movie like, after that? Huh? Did, did she watch the movie after that? I don't know if it, <laughs> I know when I saw Toby Jack Saunders after knowing D, I had a nightmare about Tony, Toby Jack Saunders. Oh. So he was a really good bad guy. And he loved it because he was, a, you know, he was raised by a Baptist minister and he was raised to be a good guy. And by gosh, he just loved playing the bad guys because it gave him that opportunity. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, that's funny. Can you imagine? Yeah. Man, oh man, yeah. that's been like that? Oh boy. Just like that. It was yeah. just, he almost did it to me sitting in his hospital bed when he told me that. He almost, you know, reached over and grabbed me and I saw for a moment that look in his eye and, and I, maybe he pulled back because he thought, well, I made her cry. I don't want to make you cry too. But he, when he was telling me the story, he was reliving it a little bit. That's and funny. he got that look in his eye, and I went, yeah, I know. That's Toby Jack Saunders. I said, that guy scared me half to death. And he says, we're going to have to resurrect that hombre. <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping to do is resurrect that hombre for the Star Trek fans and the Westerns fans so that they will, again, look at that part of his career because he oh, was yeah. fabulous. Okay, oh, that's, that's a great point. So Enough of that. That's okay, Chris. So, okay. so how and where can they find DeForest Kelly up close and personal a harvest of memories from the fan who knew him best? The absolute best place is from my website, yellowballoonpublications.com, because I have just finished um, making an audio book of it where I narrate it. Um, and at the end of that book, there's a 15 or 20 minute segment of voicemail messages that I received from Dee and Carolyn and from AC Lyles and from Harv Bennett and from other Hollywood, Tippi Hedren, other Hollywood notables when I was working in Hollywood, voicemail messages they left me. Oh, um, wow, that's a great, yes. great bonus, yeah. Because I thought, I want people to also hear Carolyn's voice. A lot of people have never heard Carolyn's voice. No. Mrs. Kelly. and. Yeah. You know, he said, I make the living, but she makes the living worthwhile. When you hear her voice, you'll, you'll, you'll get that. She's just a, you know, she was a wonderful person. So Great. And that's great. There's an audio version, too, because, you know, people love to listen to things in, in the car, on the ride. Exactly. You know, exactly. So there's that version. There's also a PDF version at yellowballoonpublications.com. You can also, you can also get two soft cover versions, one with full color images inside and one with black and white images inside um, at Amazon. But I did the PDF version because when you put the middleman in there, the, mm -hmm. by the time Amazon gets its cut, it's like, oh my gosh, who can afford this thing? I think the black and white version is, it's a long book, it's 10, 12 hours of enjoyment. But the black and white version is uh, $24.99 and the color version is Fifty four ninety nine, I think. And that's just too steep a hill for a lot of fans to climb. And I did not want that to happen. So I put out a PDF version that's twelve ninety nine, and that is full color inside. Although you can't hold a book in your hands, you can still get, you know, the entire manuscript and those wonderful pictures that are inside in full color. So I just wanted to make it affordable to everybody. That's great. That was my plan. Is like my whole idea is to extend Dee's legacy. I don't want to make uh, money the issue that that can't happen. No, that's that's great. So, and and yeah, yeah. And I th I downloaded it on Kindle. No pictures. I was bumming. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, there are pictures and on the Kindle version. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't is know. The, Maybe they're at the very 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 end, past the index or something. They're in the middle. I'm going to look at that. I was sure. I I'm sure they're there. They're right, just about right smack in the middle. Oh, you should, okay. All right. Well, we'll have to. I'll go back. You probably, I, you probably I, scrolled by him because you were in the middle of a story. 
No, it, it would say, you know, um, parentheses, you know, pictures here or whatever. And then I'd go through a few and it would just say parentheses. Now, maybe um, maybe I have an older iPad or something and it, I couldn't download it or something. But, Possibly, uh, yeah. The one I've got certainly um, has it. Is, yeah, I'm going yeah. through, right through it here. I'm going, I don't know. Okay. All right, okay. but we'll hunt. We'll hunt. Okay. No worries. No worries. Okay. Very good. So with that, um, Chris, we'll, we'll 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 wish you fair winds and following seas, and 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 right. hope to have you back here soon. You say when I'll be here. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. So you can find us on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course, you can always stream or download the MP3 file from our website at Trek.fm and grab the RSS link as well. If you're an Apple user, please be sure to hit the subscription button. That makes it easier for our listeners to find the show when they search for iTunes. And we love new listeners, so please, please, please subscribe directly to Standard Orbit as well as the Trek FM Master Feed and help us increase our visibility for new listeners. Also, we would ask you to help us out with Patreon. Well, what is Patreon? Well, Patreon is the method that we use to fund the network. So I would encourage you all, if you can, if you can afford it, to go on to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Trek FM, and become a patron. And for as little as $15 a month, you can join Trek FM's patron roundtable, which is wonderful. I mean, this is how I found my way onto the network. And who knows? What could happen to you, right? You, you might find your way. And then if you're kind enough to donate $25 per month or more, uh, you get associate producer credit for the shows of your choice, and that's a big deal. And speaking of that, we would like to say thank you always to our associate producers for this show, for Standard Orbit, Renee Roberts, Richard Rutledge, and Aaron Harvey. Thanks so much for all of your support for both Standard Orbit and for Trek FM through Patreon. You can find Renee on Twitter at MRES underscore 1701. Richard, you can find at at RUT8972. And you can find our buddy Aaron Harvey at Geek Filter, all on Twitter. So look them up, follow them, and, uh, and thank you again. And if you'd like to get in touch with us here at Trek FM, you can always find us on trek.fm slash contact and look into the sidebar on the show page. Or you can go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm. And please leave us a voice message that we can play here on the show. You can hear your own voice on the podcast. Pretty fun. So feel free to do that. And you can also contact us through Twitter at Trek FM or through Facebook at Facebook.com slash Trek FM and the Babel Conference. To find us at the Babel Conference, type the Babel Conference, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at Trek.fm and click discussion on the menu bar. Babel Conference is a great way for you to connect with fellow listeners, and the hosts of the network. So as for me personally, you can find me on Twitter at MoronZach. That's M-O-O-R-E-O-N-Z-A-C-H. And I'm also the host of my own podcast called Always Hold On to Smallville, where we talk about each and every episode of that young Superman TV show. And we're on Twitter at AlwaysMallville with one S. What about you, Ken? So you can find me as well on the Babel Conference. That's where I like to hang out. It's my favorite spot on Facebook, to be honest with you. It's the safest, funnest uh, most respectful spot to talk Star Trek on the entire interweb. So look for me there and feel free to also look for me on Facebook at any time and feel free to IM me with questions or or, or if you just want to hook up and be friends. Or you can uh, you can get information from me via Twitter. Yes, I am on Twitter now at Boston SCPO. That's Boston Senior Chief Petty Officer SCPO. And I look forward to communicating with you in between these shows and especially when they drop. That's when it's a lot of fun. So we'll talk to you soon. So thanks, everyone, again for listening. And join us next time here on Trek.fm for another episode of Standard Orbit.